Greetings. The Sisters of Charity of Seton Hill invited me to present the 2018 Sister Mary Schmidt SC Lecture, Debating Immigration, Law in the Midst of Exile. I was honored to present the lecture on March 15, 2018, in the centennial year of Seton Hill University. Congratulations to all at Seton Hill for your 10 decades of powerful witness to your mission. I give thanks to my host, Sister Barbara Einloff, SC, to all the Sisters of Charity at Seton Hill, to Seton Hill University President, Dr. Mary Finger, and the faculty, staff, and students who offered such gracious hospitality to me during my visit. Thank you. To make this lecture available to more members of the Sisters of Charity at Seton Hill and their community, and to others interested in the issues of immigration, exile, and Catholic social thought, we have re-recorded this lecture on July 26, 2018, at DePaul University, with the permission of the Sisters of Charity. I add one postscript to the lecture. Since the lecture was presented, the federal government has implemented a zero tolerance policy at its borders, detaining immigrants and refugees, turning some away, and separating families in detention facilities throughout our nation. Under these federal policies, refugees who are seeking asylum and the lawful protection of the United States refugee law have been denied that process. Some families have experienced members being deported, others in detention for lengthy periods of time, minor children left without their parents in detention facilities. Some children have even appeared in immigration court proceedings without legal representation. These policies undermined the United States' responsibility to protect refugees under domestic and international law. The number of separated families, the number of refugees who have been denied proper process, requires us to look anew at the biblical narrative and Catholic social thought to develop new responses to protect the dignity of all seeking the protections of our laws and the hospitality of our nation. Thank you. I note that this lecture falls on the anniversary of the death of Louise de Marillac. Her spiritual testament given to those gathered around her on March 15, 1660, reminds us of our collaborative mission together. Quote, take good care of the service of the poor, unquote. St. Louise, presente. I trust we will all be engaged in that task as you have asked me to speak about Catholic social thought and immigration. As I engage in that task, you have helped me learn more about your institution and St. Elizabeth Ann Seton. I found it valuable to read about her trip to Italy with her sick husband, Fearing he was contagious, the authorities quarantined him for over a month in a cold detention center. Italian immigration authorities separated her family. She experienced the difficulties those seeking a better life endure in crossing human-made borders. The month-long detention probably hastened William's death. At the same time, as Sister Betty Ann McNeil writes, quote, Despite the death of her husband, the gracious hospitality of the Italian family, the Felicis, transformed their lives forever. Unquote. My talk will return to gracious hospitality, but it was inspiring to know of the story of faith and pilgrimage and the response of those who welcomed the stranger to the shores of Italy that so faithfully followed the biblical narrative of care. Your community also finds itself in the midst of celebrating a century of educating young women and men to be engaged in that service. Congratulations. 
You have much to celebrate. I am honored to be part of your year-long testimony to the remarkable vision and perseverance you have demonstrated throughout the last 10 decades. I propose to re-examine our national immigration narrative as well as Catholic social thoughts immigration narrative. I suggest that by looking at it through a new dimension, we will discover new ways to live our mission. Indeed, I hope to persuade you that all Catholics, indeed all Christians, should reconsider whether to permit the state to rely on deportation and private detention as tools to regulate immigration. I know this bold claim may stand in opposition to what you may believe is the national, biblical, and Catholic immigration narrative. But your hundred years of faithful witness gives me strength to continue. Indeed, your mission tempered my timidity. Sister Francesca inaugurated your commitment to education and pursuing the truth when she authored one of your guiding principles that you, quote, are bound by no traditions and you fear nothing but God's disfavor and the closed mind, unquote. Therefore, let me hazard yet forward with my proposal to eliminate deportation and radically change private detention as part of United States immigration policy. Your centennial also provides a good starting point as 1918 sadly marked a profound shift in how the United States envisioned and implemented its immigration policies, with critical changes in who were welcome. Deportation became an increasingly important tool for immigration regulation. Prior to 1918, deportation was rarely used to correct any post-entry conduct by those seeking our shores. Fines, incarceration, and other remedies were employed. Although those seeking to restrict immigration were quite active in the first two decades of the 20th century, both sides of the immigration debate, such as Jane Addams who favored immigration and those who opposed immigration, shared a common task, if not a common purpose. Each side focused their efforts on Americanizing immigrants quickly to enable them to become fully engaged members of society rather than removing them through deportation. The end of World War I, however, marked a shift in both public attitudes and the legal regime by emphasizing deportation as a remedy. Fears of foreign anarchists fueled the Palmer raids, leading to thousands arrested and hundreds deported the United States increasingly deported more individuals each year. The change dramatically impacted United States policy. Professor Mai Nagai wrote that prior to 1918, quote, it seemed unconscionable to expel immigrants after they had settled in the country and had begun to assimilate, unquote. John Hyam states that with the signing of the armistice ending World War I, quote, the new drive for restriction had a drastic quality inconceivable in the decades before the war, unquote. Some called for a complete suspension of any immigration for up to 50 years. Although immigration was never suspended during the last century, we have seen the power to deport increase with now almost 400,000 persons deported each year. We are told that the current infrastructure permits no more than 400,000 deportations a year, unless more civil liberties are eviscerated and less due process offered. Our legal system fails to meet our fundamental promises of our Constitution and democracy, while billions of dollars are expended on the deportation system. Thus, the centennial you celebrate, marked as it is with many wonderful successes and witnesses to the power of your mission, has also demonstrated the loss of fundamental liberties with the expansion of the deportation and detention regime that I will challenge this evening. I urge you tonight to commence your second hundred years 
with a commitment to end deportation of our sisters and brothers and to end the inhumane private detention regime that plagues our nation. As with your centennial celebration, our nation has many narratives that reflect its deepest wishes as well as its history. Immigration contributes greatly to that narrative. I will speak of three narratives tonight. We claim to be a nation of immigrants. George Washington recognized our openness to all, welcoming those fleeing persecution and welcoming the stranger. Ellis Island presents a broader narrative, mostly good, but not without its sadness. Three of my grandparents came through its doors. A few of the almost 12 million who came through Ellis Island when it served as the point of entry for New York City. But we should not forget that over 240,000 were also excluded and sent back. All their stories help frame our history. Most immigration debates commence with an acceptance that the nation state has a right to control its borders and deport those whom the nation determines do not belong. Biblical religion, however, names a different sovereign, God, that raises challenges about immigration law. As people of faith, we follow a concurrent story that weaves the biblical narrative throughout our faith choices and our history. Formed as a people bookmarked by two great exiles, the time in Egypt followed by the Exodus and the exile in Babylon, the faith story found in the biblical narrative arises out of a people who knew the pain and sorrow of living in exile. God tells the Israelites, when a stranger sojourns with you in your land, you shall not do the immigrant wrong. The stranger who sojourns with you shall be to you as a native among you, and you shall love the immigrant as yourself. For you were strangers in the land of Egypt, for you too were slaves in Egypt. I am the Lord your God. After reminding them that they must love God, this exhortation to love the stranger as a native appears more than 30 times in the Bible, more than any other commandment. I will return to this narrative but from the Hebrews in the Old Testament to the nomadic ways of Jesus and St. Paul, our biblical narrative constantly reminds us that exile and migration are part of our biblical history. After reviewing much of Old Testament theological scholarship, Walter Brueggemann argues that for both Jews and Christians, quote, the core of faith is situated in the matrix of exile, unquote. My basic argument stems from this core of faith that led a people in exile to develop a biblical narrative that calls us to deny deportation as a government remedy. Based on its covenant with God and its experience of exile, Israel attempted to model a different alternative from the many imperial states surrounding it. Although other religions surrounding the biblical Israelites often voice similar concerns for the poor, scholar Norman Lofink has cautioned against viewing concern for the poor as unique to Israel's faith. He found similar comments in both Mesopotamian and Egyptian wisdom texts. But found within our biblical narrative, however, quote, care for the stranger in the land is distinctive to Israel, unquote. It then becomes distinctive to our biblical narrative. Given their profound sorrow over exile, the texts suggest welcome and hospitality, not deportation. If one is called to treat the stranger as a native and the native cannot be deported, then how can the state deport the immigrant? If the immigrant did something wrong that might make them deportable, then punish them like a native would be punished, not with exile. Perhaps deportation would be a last resort in case of extreme violence, but not as a regular tool as we use it today in the United States. Given that debate, we also possess a long history of Catholic social thought, which also weaves together the national and biblical narratives. 
we have recognized the tension between the sovereign nation state and following a sovereign God. Thomas Betts has summarized Catholic social thought in these three points with regards to immigration. You can see the tension built into the summary. Every human has a right to leave a country, a right to migrate to seek a better life. Countries also can regulate their borders. But you will find no similar right permitting individuals to enter another country without that nation's permission. Therefore, the third point, nations and their statutes are urged to address those seeking entry with justice and mercy. Too often in the last 100 years, however, the balance has shifted in protecting the nation-state and ignoring the justice and mercy. Hannah Arendt, after examining the major refugee movements after World War I, stressed the failure of the nation-states to protect refugees. She argued that, quote, the transformation of the state from an instrument of law into an instrument of the nation had been completed. The nation had conquered the state. National interest had priority over law, unquote. As our Constitution provides, we the people came together to form a more perfect union, to form a state where liberty and justice are protected through law. But nation-states also transform themselves to protect the state and violate laws and detain people to protect the state, often in the name of law, but laws that no longer guarantee liberty for all. When those speaking from the Christian narrative attempt to rebut that claim, we see the tension in our midst. For example, Steve Bannon, speaking in Europe in early March, celebrated the populist electoral victories in Italy, claiming that the Italian voters, quote, spurned Pope Francis, who has urged tolerance for migrants. This vote was a rejection of the Pope, unquote. As with Hannah Arendt, the mass migrations that are occurring today threaten the original purpose of the nation state. The tension between the national narrative and the biblical narrative threatens to eclipse the dialogue solely in favor of the nation-state. The narratives to build bigger walls and deport all who are different obliterates the immigration narrative and rejects the voice that calls us to love the stranger as a native and thus undermines the strength and effect of the biblical narrative in our lives. All of these narratives are important. Yale law professor Jack Balkin notes the critical significant stories about the Constitution and the Bible provide for our civic community. He writes, quote, We must have a way to talk about the commitments of a people in a creedal tradition spanning many years, involving the work of many generations, constantly subject to change and circumstances that are sometimes recognized and sometimes not, and organized around the maintenance and interpretation of an ancient creedal text. We call upon each other by calling upon our past. We use the past to talk to each other in the present about our common future, our common constitutional project. Unquote. Your centennial timeline shows how we talk between our generations for our common future. We have dueling stories about immigration and law in this nation. In one sense, it looks like this house. I was walking in downstate Illinois one morning, and I saw this house. If you look carefully, over the front door is a big sign that says, Welcome. At the street level, however, there is an iron fence with a security warning saying no trespassing. A big American flag hangs from the front porch. What message is this house providing? As I pondered that house, I wondered about a thought experiment to judge how these traditions challenge and support each other. What would happen if United States immigration law was in effect at the time of the Bible. We start 
were the exile of Adam and Eve from the garden. Possessing no visas, they could enter no other country. They are exiles for life. Similarly, Abraham and Sarah are told to go forth from their country to the land that I will show you. But once they arrive without an immigration visa, they would not be allowed in. The founders of our faith story excluded at the border. Think of the great story of Noah and the ark. We love to tell this story to our children. When Noah landed, he landed in another country. Although immigration law has an exemption from smuggling if one brings in their family and therefore would be able to avoid the immigration violation of smuggling, there is no exemption for daughters-in-law. Noah is convicted of smuggling and prevented from being part of the biblical narrative. Joseph's brothers sell him into slavery. The brothers who become the tribes of Israel would be guilty of trafficking and therefore unable to immigrate and form a new nation. We do love the story of Joseph and his multicolored coat, but we also forget that he was in prison for two years for attempted rape. Although we know from the biblical narrative that Joseph was innocent, immigration law does not permit immigration judges to look behind a conviction. Joseph's conviction and time in jail for two years makes him an aggravated felon and therefore ineligible to enter our country. No story of Joseph in our biblical narrative. Joseph's brothers are also accused of being spies or terrorists. This, too, would be a violation of immigration law, and they would again be excluded from the story. Moses, the great leader of the Exodus, the one who gave us the Ten Commandments, the Torah, was also a murderer. That crime makes him an aggravated felon, and he would not be part of the story. One of the great love stories of all time is the story of Ruth. And yet, when her husband died, she had no way to immigrate or enter Bethlehem. Moreover, by gleaning, she proved that she was poor and therefore would be a public charge, which also makes her ineligible for immigration. No Ruth, no King David, no story that follows through our biblical narrative. Perhaps no one in the Bible had more immigration violations than Jesus, the one we proclaim without sin, the one who was perfect. Recall, shortly after his birth, his parents and he fled to Egypt to avoid persecution by Herod. Imagine when they returned to Israel from Egypt how Joseph would prove he was the biological father of Jesus. More likely, Joseph would be arrested for trafficking a young woman and a child, and all three would be excluded from our borders. Under immigration law, every immigrant has the burden of proving that they indeed are lawfully present or they're presumed to be unlawful and deported. In the Gospel of John, we're told the authorities did not know where Jesus comes from. That alone makes him deportable and removable from the country. Some say that Jesus was perfect and therefore could not be deportable because he committed no sin. Even Jesus' acts of love, however, made him deportable. We tell the beautiful story of feeding the 5,000 by breaking the loaves and fishes and sharing with the hungry. An act of pure love. An act done with love. Yet Rome considered the Galileans who Jesus fed terrorists, and our immigration laws make one deportable or excludable for material aid to terrorists. Feeding terrorists is included in the category that makes one deportable. Of course, Jesus is eventually arrested and convicted and executed for the crime of sedition. Any one of these would make Jesus deportable all of them show how many ways this innocent man 
was made deportable from the story. You might say that St. Paul tells the story and therefore we might still have a narrative. Yet recall that St. Paul was also a persecutor of the early Christians. Our immigration laws bars persecutors from entry. And before you get too comfortable, recall that even St. Vincent de Paul, early in his ministry, was accused of stealing a horse. That theft would be considered an aggravated felony under immigration law, and therefore St. Vincent de Paul is excluded from the story. We have no Vincentian family and would not be here today if U.S. immigration law had been in effect at the time of St. Vincent. If immigration law had prevailed, we possess no story. We have no witnesses to God's saving history, no history of Emmanuel, God with us. We have no story to tell. Given that result, is it not fair to ask, who are the immigration laws keeping out or deporting today? What divine strangers have failed to come to our door because we have an immigration policy that offers little forgiveness, justice, or mercy? What are we doing to ourselves today? Would we have these conflicts of conscience over security if no Bible story existed? Would it just be who could build the strongest and tallest wall? Would no ideas of justice and mercy influence national policy? Would we become just like a medieval kingdom, a castle walled off from all, not just immigrants, but commerce, strangers, trade, and new possibilities? Perplexing questions. When perplexed, I love to read alumni magazines. I get to see what other academics are working on and read about areas of study completely different from mine. Four years before the first encyclical contributing to Catholic social teaching, Rerum Novarum, was published, the simple Petri dish was invented. Science has never been the same. But I recently saw this article in my alumni magazine, Into the Third Dimension. Traditionally, most cancer research and drug studies involved what Professor Dennis Wirtz called two-dimensional research in a Petri dish. Through modern technology, Professor Wirtz studied drugs and cancer in three dimensions. Dr. Wirtz has found the cells act differently in the Petri dish than they do in three dimensions. Somehow, the bottom of the Petri dish interferes with the cells to the detriment of the efficacy of the drugs. Drugs that do not work in the Petri dish might, however, work in 3D. He suggests that many promising drugs that failed in the Petri dish experiments may instead be successful in 3D. Imagine that, starting almost all cancer research over and perhaps finding drugs that will work in the body that failed in the Petri dish. You did not come to receive a science lesson, but I wondered, is the invitation to live the vision a chance, metaphorically at least, to move from the second dimension during the last 100 years, to think anew of how Catholic social thought and United States immigration law might be different? Let me pose one more thought experiment. What would be our policy if influenced by the biblical narrative without the functions of the nation state? First, we are comforted that our exploration begins and remains with God. God is my sovereign. Even if the nation state, which claims sovereignty, could, through its immigration laws, attempt to take away my narrative, I have a recourse. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through the Word, and without the Word, not one thing came into being. What has become into being is the Word was life, and the life was light of all people. The light shines in the deepest night, and the night did not overcome it. God tells me, the Logos is true. I can still claim 
the biblical narrative. The Word tells us to welcome the stranger. Indeed, figuring out our relationship to God based on a people's experience as an exiled people provides us with a map of understanding. Indeed, the narrative suggests a way to explore a third approach, metaphorically, a new dimension of thinking about immigration as an exiled people ourselves. Instead of simply conceding that we are citizens of a nation-state, we can also respond as a people in exile, as our biblical ancestors responded. Let me remind you Walter Brigham's claim that the core of faith is situated in the matrix of exile. Elizabeth Collier strikes a similar tone when she explains that loving the stranger is no, quote, isolated quotation taken from the text, but part of the thematic fabric of the sacred texts and therefore revelatory for contemporary Christian life, unquote. Scholars have suggested that our biblical narrative, written in this framework of exile, leads the Israelites not to abandon God or make religion purely private, but, quote, exile evoked the most brilliant literature and the most daring theological articulation in the Old Testament, unquote. Significantly, the Levitical command has several parts. To treat the stranger as a native. Why? Because you too were slaves in Egypt. Your lives were constrained in ways out of your control. You too were in exile. It was Yahweh, God, who saved you. God's saving power led us out to the promised land. Do not forget that we are created in God's image. We are in covenant with a God who saves. We are called to ennoble that human dignity in each one and act as God in similar ways. The United States bishops, in their work on economic justice, reminded us, quote, As such, every human being possesses an inalienable dignity that stamps human existence prior to any division into races or nations and prior to human labor and human achievement, unquote. We are called to make this interpretation and articulation relevant in our lives today. Even those of us who did not live the actual narrative must live it today in how we understand the text. That challenge remains today. Who are the Garim within the United States today? The biblical narrative also tells us of a people living in Israel who were not considered Israelites. The Israelites had to decide how to treat them within their society. The Bible's response describes them as the, quote, gerim, unquote, or, quote, ger, unquote. As Professor Andre Lecoq writes, quote, the ger is a stranger who has to settle in Israel for an extended period or even permanently, on par with widows and orphans, unquote. Many are the undocumented living in our midst. The global preeminence and power of the United States make that task of imagination difficult. But it also undermines believing in a core of faith founded on engaging life in exile. As people of faith, we live in a nation that has been torn over the last 30 years in discerning the appropriate law to address the Garim, the sojourner, in our midst. Founded as a nation welcoming immigrants and refugees, our nation has seen increasingly more restrictive laws and policies implemented to control the perceived problem. Surprisingly, as our laws have become more restrictive, we have seen the unauthorized population, yes, the biblical Garim, expand from approximately 3 million to over 10 million, spurred on by legal walls of restrictions. We have built a legal wall that keeps people from leaving. We are responsible for them. They are our garim. These laws have encouraged persons who would otherwise have returned to their native lands under a more forgiving regime to stay and not lose potential remedies. And then we call them, quote, illegal, unquote, and say it is their problem. 
At one time, politicians talked of banishment rather than deportation. James Madison asserted, quote, If a banishment of this sort be not punishment, and among the severest of punishments, it will be difficult to imagine a doom to which the name can be applied. In the Supreme Court's first case upholding the congressional plenary power to control immigration, Justice Brewer wrote in dissent, quote, Deportation is punishment. It involves first an arrest, a deprival of liberty, and second, a removal from home, from family, from business, from property, unquote. In almost religious terms, Justice Brandeis later wrote that deportation, quote, may also result in loss of both property and life or of all that makes life worth living, unquote. This is not merely speculative. We witness today the deaths of individuals recently deported from the United States. We also witness the deaths of our communities when parents, brothers, sisters, workers, taxpayers are deported, leaving our parishes weakened and our cities less secure. The Gerim, the strangers living in the midst of Israel, should be treated as a native. The Gerim are similar to the millions of unauthorized residents living within the United States. Many unauthorized immigrants have lived here for more than a decade, paying taxes and Social Security, building community, and supporting those institutions that make our communities stronger. Many tell me that they are illegal and therefore deserve to be deported. Have you ever asked what it means to be illegal in terms of immigration law? You might say that you break the law and therefore deserve to be deported. Immigration is a civil law, not a criminal law. Scholars suggest that more than half of the undocumented persons now residing in the United States did not cross the border illegally, but simply overstayed the time they were permitted to remain on a lawful visa. Yes, they are deportable, but not illegal. They are not criminals for this civil violation. They have committed a civil violation. You might respond, well, the other half committed a crime by crossing the border. What is the violation for crossing the border at a place other than an authorized inspection station? 8 U.S. Code Section 1325 says that one found to have entered improperly or at other than a place designated by immigration officers may be fined at least $50 and not more than $250 for each such entry or imprisoned not more than six months or both. Does such a minor offense deserve banishment or deportation? In Pennsylvania, for example, what kind of violations result in a fine of $50 or up to six months in prison? It appears that you have summary offenses that can result in a maximum fine of $250 and imprisonment of 90 days or less. These include crimes like fishing without a license, illegal parking, and driving through a red light. Our immigration laws are devastating families, banning parents from returning for more than 10 years, or perhaps permanently, even though the actual alleged, quote, illegal, quote, act face the same criminal penalty as driving through a red light or illegally parking. This punitive act of deportation for an immigration violation does not match the equivalent act of illegal parking. This leads to a problem for our law. Because immigration is a civil violation, immigrants do not get the full protection of the Constitution. Yet the penalty they face in deportation is far more grave than similar violations under civil or criminal law. Under the Constitution, a criminal defendant is entitled to a lawyer at government expense. But anyone in the civil immigration proceedings does not have the same protection. This disparity cries out as a moral outrage. The punishment is far disproportionate to the violation. If we are to treat the stranger as the native, we must end the deportation. Given this disparity in civil and criminal law, we also witness how the Border Patrol and the Immigration's Custom Enforcement 
otherwise known as ICE, have threatened the peace and security of our communities with their raids. ICE has taken an increasingly aggressive enforcement tactic, arresting immigrants, taking their children to school, stopping ambulances on the way to the hospital. The Border Patrol has poured out water on the desert, arrested people waiting medical care, arresting immigrants coming to lawful proceedings, and even entering Greyhound buses to check on paperwork. Each of these ends up removing a productive member of our society and also leaves a gaping hole. Our parishes and communities find themselves without volunteers, coaches, caretakers, and many others that help strengthen the fabric of our communities. We must again ask ourselves, does this cost to our society deprive us of the stranger who shows us the divine? Let us also look about our narrative of detention. One of the foundational elements of Catholic social teaching is that of stewardship, to care for the earth, and to view that the goods of the earth are to be viewed as gifts to all. Catholic social teaching has taught that, quote, the focus of the church with regard to migration and human mobility is that the needs, dignity, and flourishing of human persons must be the primary category of concern. Most laws governing migration focus almost exclusively on the needs of the nation state. The social teaching asserts that the needs of the individual, the stranger, the alien, the migrant, must be considered as well and hold a primary place in the discussion, unquote. We are called to be good stewards. As I have stated since 1986, the immigration laws have become more restrictive. In 1986, we had approximately 3 million undocumented in this nation, but now have over 10 million. Despite more money and staff to enforce our laws, the work has backfired. We have built a reverse Berlin Wall to keep people from leaving. Even physical walls meant to deter make it harder for people to leave. Legal restrictions punish people if they do leave. The Border Patrol is our nation's largest police force, with plans to make it larger as it expands its work beyond our borders. Deportation costs money. ICE estimates in 2016 it costs about $1,900 to transport an individual for deportation. ICE also reports that it costs almost $3.2 billion to detect, detain, and remove. The detention budget is $2.6 billion for 205 facilities. Private companies run 73 of those facilities and make profits off detaining people, providing improper medical care and poor nutrition. We detain almost 400,000 persons per year. And if detention becomes mandatory for all, it may increase our budget by over $900 million. We have witnessed an alarming number of deaths in private detention facilities. In the fall of 2017, I visited a private detention center in Eloy, Arizona, one of the deadliest private facilities in the nation. As we drove up, this ambulance was leaving the facility. A stark reminder of the health concerns that our private immigration detention system has caused. One federal court described the egregious conditions of the holding cells for minors and their mothers in immigration detention facilities. The high costs are also surprising as this court noted the government should have done more planning to meet its legal obligations than they have. St. Vincent asked us, why do we detain children? What have we learned from the biblical narrative of our choice to let the children come to us? He was criticized for going out and saving children abandoned by society and taught us that we should respond differently. This cannot be the good stewardship 
that Catholic social teaching teaches us. This slide of sunset over Eloy reminds me of a contemporary United States Calvary, death, detention, and deportation at Eloy, Arizona. Is there only one Vincentian way? And if so, which way? I have raised perplexing questions. Vincent and Louise, and I suspect Elizabeth Ann Seton, knew these arguments of conventional wisdom would confront their mission. Vincent warned his friends that the alleged wisdom of the world would continually urge them not to go out and associate with the poor or be distressed because it was too hard, too dangerous, and too expensive. He was counseled against visiting the mentally ill or the galley slaves, but he did. He and Louise were warned not to go to the border towns where wars transformed residents into starving refugees, but he did. Most apt, especially for the current crisis of women and children at our border, critics challenged him not to care for the abandoned children as they were already overwhelmed by other ministries. Vincent recognized that sending out members of the community countered a natural human propensity to employ the power of the law to wall itself off from the poor. We, in seeking our own security, became the captives. Vincent said, we are the captives to the world's temptations. One had to leave the comforts and security to go to those places where the law, whether it be the king, the army, or the elite, divided some and abandoned them. Immigration law, by design, segregates humans, blessing some with the state's imprimatur of acceptance while banishing others through deportation or detention. Vincent, Louise, and Elizabeth offered us a different response. You are starting your next 100 years. Let us change the debate and the two dimensions of the sovereign nation state. Debate on immigration reform has become paralyzed by reliance on polar opposites of 100% border control as opposed to granting a pathway to citizenship for the unauthorized living in the land and a more efficient and effective system. If people of faith bring these arguments to the debate, it changes the focus once Christians refuse to concede that deportation is a necessary law to protect the nation. Dana Wilbanks argues, quote, precisely what is needed is the enlivening of public moral discourse through the encounter to persons and communities that bear genuine different ethical perspectives. Religious ethics can best serve the public ethos by dislocating the stale conventional conversation by narratives and symbols which stimulate the moral imagination. He continues that by looking to how Israel treated the vulnerable, the Gerim, quote, the Levite who represented the dependence and vulnerability which characterizes all human existence, quote, unquote, will offer, quote, an imaginative and challenging point of reference for interpreting and responding to these dilemmas, unquote. We indeed are the ones in exile, but the Garim in our midst can show us the gift of the divine. Your specific narrative began when a family was separated by immigration authorities in Italy. You know the pain such separation causes. As you look to your next hundred years, let us establish a timeline of turning the tide against detention and deportation. Let us reveal the faces on that new timeline of those we have shown gracious hospitality in welcoming them into our society. That timeline, moreover, is not just a biblical or religious narrative. Our national narrative has caused some to say that our nation has been a beacon of liberty to the world. Some say we must protect that nation because we are exceptional. We are a city on a hill. You are a university on a hill. Recall, however, 
when that metaphor was first used, John Winthrop shared it with his pilgrim band about to embark in this new land. He did not stop with exceptionalism, however. Rather, he warned his friends that should they fall short in establishing justice, God might very well exile them back into the sea. Are we still that city on a hill? Are we that university on a hill, a beacon for all to see? Let us recall the gracious hospitality offered by the Felici family to Elizabeth Seton and her family. Let us be exceptional in our gracious hospitality, such that we are a beacon of liberty and justice to the world. Thank you.